This is fun reading through these questions. These are, these are great. You can tell which ones came from K-State and which from KU. <laughs> we'll, we'll get some of that out of the way first. So this is more a statement than a question, really. And this came from, uh, uh, I think it's Geo Snyder from the class of 63 saying, how about them Wildcats 5 and 0? I guess there's no comment needed when you're 5 and 0, is there? <laughs> okay, from, from so far, somebody so far, so good. On, on, in, in the Lawrence crowd, I believe, I would guess, it doesn't say it wasn't signed, uh, was Bill Snyder the football coach when you were at K-State? <laughs> You know, he, actually he wasn't. Um, we had several coaches. Uh, I don't know how many games we won when I was a student there, but I went to all of them. And I can remember getting very excited when we'd score. <laughs> and usually when we'd score, it'd be late in the fourth quarter. The other team would have its third team on the field. We'd still be charging away with our first team. And so the score would be 47 to seven Oklahoma over Kansas State, but we scored. And that was reason enough to go to Aggieville and celebrate that. <laughs> we had different standards before the Bill Snyder era. Good answer. We, we received, as you can imagine, a lot However, of... However, let me just go on to say, sure. to say this. Um, I think three of the four years I was at K-State, we won the Big Eight basketball uh, championship every year. Okay? So we had our compensation. It just is a little different. <laughs> Great. So I, I suspect one of these questions is the one you are asked most often. I'm going to kind of give you a two-part one, but um, so kind of like but, a reporter. But yeah, well, I'll be easy. Um, Bin Laden, some of his major folks have been taken care of. Uh, we're pulling out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, your general view of the war on terrorism: Are we safer than we were, say, when you were in as as chair? Um, you know, what is the environment like? And then the second part is with Iran and Saudi Arabia, you know, if you were back in your uniform, what would you be thinking in terms of U.S. activity related to that, sanctions, et cetera? So first part, sort of I, state of terrorism. I, I think clearly we're a lot safer today than we were uh, back in 2001. There's a lot of things that have happened, some of which have happened with MRI Global. We've been participating in some of the things that make us safer. But we've reorganized to the Department of Homeland Security, the Director of National Intelligence, trying to bring all the intelligence together so we don't have so many silos where a piece of really critical information uh, goes unheeded. Um, and so I think in, in many ways we're safer. We, Al-Qaeda is a battered organization right now. They're killing Osama bin Laden and a couple more very senior people in Al-Qaeda. One is a uh, potential replacement. Um, and so it's been disrupted greatly. I don't think we've solved the basic problem, though, and that is the propensity of men and women to join jihad. And uh, the military can't do this alone. This, this takes uh, all instruments of national power, the diplomatic, the political, the economic instrument, the information instrument of national power, and not just the U.S., but the international community, if we want to deal with some of these issues, and I'll just point out one of them, uh, the fact that in, in many countries in the Middle East, education consists of a madrasa that teaches very, a, a very religious curriculum, but doesn't prepare people for the 21st century. And in fact, in the religious curriculum, that teaches hate and intolerance. And in, until some of those issues are resolved, I'm afraid we're going to have to deal with this for, for probably generations. So I think we're a lot safer today, we're better, but uh, we haven't gotten to where we need to go about Iran and uh, targeting the Saudi ambassador on our soil. And that is absolutely that's... bizarre, don't mm -hmm. you think? Yeah. So here, here is a country, Iran, that sponsors state terrorism, developing a nuclear weapon, proliferates weapons. There's lots of ways they could have done that, I think, without maybe contracting with a Mexican drug gang <laughs> to do it, if that's even true. And I don't, I don't have the facts, so I don't, I don't know what people know about that. Um, but Iran, I think, continues to be this, this big danger. P President Obama has said that the United States will prevent Iran from achieving a nuclear weapons capability. So that is the official U.S. position. On the other hand, the only, the only tool we have right now in the, in the toolkit are sanctions, U.N. sanctions against Iran. They're having an effect. They're having a big effect. 
uh, it's, uh, it's really hurt their economy. But as one of my friends in India said once, after a bad experience with an Iranian businessman, he said, remember, Iranian, uh, Iran is a Shia nation, and the Shia pride themselves on being able to tolerate pain. So there, there's a lot of pain on them economically, but they're tolerating it. And you, you have to wonder, when is push going to come to shove as they continue the development of the nuclear weapon, assuming they do, uh, with, with our president's statement that we're not going to allow them to do that. And he's not the first president to say that, so, but that's the U.S. policy. So I, one of the things I worry about is, will this lead, could this potentially lead to conflict if we can't find another way to solve that problem? And, and sanctions, I don't think, are going to get us ready to do it. Okay, great. Moving a little bit uh, about you, uh, what are your personal plans for the future? Of course, one is to become ultimately like trustee of MRI Global. On, on, that was on number board. one. We know I that, know, and, yeah, and I, I we, that. we'll get that out of the way. But what, what are what are your thoughts about your your future? Um, that's a strange question. I I mean, you do what you do, right? I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, you know, it was uh, Bernie Rogers, uh, another Kansan, retired Army four star, um, not that long ago, but he passed away. He said after he got out of the military, he said, you know, it'd be nice to spend about a third of my time actually working and making a little money. It'd be nice to have another third of the time where you, you kind of give back and then a third of the time with family and friends. And I think that's a pretty good formula. And so, as the state, I'm on some public boards. They pay, pay you a lot of money to do that. And that allows me to do things with, uh, that I like to do with some of the charities I'm involved in, with the teaching I'm involved in, and those sorts of things. And, and come to Kansas City and participate uh, with MR. So Great. I, I don't know that's going to change a lot. And still find time with uh, the family, hopefully. Good. Do you still ride your Harley? Occasionally, yeah. yeah. Uh, I certainly started up just to listen to it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and my good friend Ed McConnell and I and, and Linda and Mary Jo doesn't know this, but we have a trip planned next summer, uh, hopefully. Uh, we've had this trip planned every year, not me yet, but, but, <laughs> but we'll, we're, we're all, we, we like to think about it anyway. So it's part, part of the process. Okay, I have to read this one. This is, this is, a, this is a really good one. Uh, a country western singer this week was quoted as saying, freedom ain't free. It reminded me that we should be doing more to support our troops. From your perspective, what can average citizens do to support our troops overseas? I, that's a great question. And, uh, and we all know freedom isn't free, and we have lots of friends and relatives, uh, our moms and dads and their moms and dads who really sacrifice a lot to make this country what it is. And it, and it doesn't have to be this way. It can be lots of ways, and it takes lots of effort to keep it, keep it this wonderful place that it is. I think the way to support the troops is uh, to realize that uh, their unemployment rate is several percentage points uh, uh, above the population as a whole right now. I think the population is what, around 9%, and, and, and veterans is, uh, returning veterans is over 13%. So I, I think work to integrate those who have uh, served on our behalf and sacrificed on our behalf and many wounded uh, on our behalf and some grievously, to find ways to integrate them back into our communities because all they, all they want is a chance to be productive citizens. And um, I think that's where we can help the most. And I think that my guess is that a lot of the companies in this room uh, probably have programs to do that. But that's, to me, uh, the best support we can provide for our, uh, our armed, armed forces. They're pretty well taken care of when they're, when they're in service. It's when they return, I like to get out, and, uh, and, and try to find work, and particularly if they've been uh, wounded, to, to integrate folks that have these grievous wounds, and to find ways to bring them back into our communities, show them we love them, and then and then put them to work. Stuff, I and mean, they want to do that. That's what they want to do. So I, it's uh, it's it's a little different take on the same mm -hmm. uh, very uh, uh, very good and very passionate uh, talk you made about. Education is sort of the same thing. Okay, great. Um, do you believe America, sort of in total, not so necessarily related to the military, uh, is on the incline or the decline, and why? Listen, I'm not one of those that thinks we're on, you know, there are probably a lot of folks in this audience that, well, some of you may be even older than I am, 
But you know, for decades, every decade, you read another article, the America's on the decline. I don't believe that for one second. We are a young nation. We, we are not a nation in decline. If you go back to our roots, I think that the book 1776 um, was, a, a, was a, great, a great insight into the, the kind of American character that kind of came up in our revolution. And it was one of courage and determination and optimism. And those traits, I think, still define us pretty darn well. And we have some severe challenges ahead of us. But I don't see us in decline. We can do anything we want to do. I mean, after all, this is the nation that put a man on the moon. We have done so many marvelous things for the world. We have sacrificed um, many men. Just the World War I Museum and Memorial, not too far from here. You think about the number of Americans that marched off the war with great optimism that they could change the course of a war that had been stagnant for years. And they did it with this great optimism, and off they went, and they did change the course of that war. And then the World War II veterans, I bet we... How many World War II veterans do we have in here? I bet we have some. Hold your hands up if you got some. I, I bet, I'm sure they're... That was back there. You think about World War II veterans, I had the uh, great honor of traveling back to Kansas with Bob Dole not too long ago to Topeka, where he was honored in the, the walk of uh, honor that they have established around the, the state capitol. And uh, just being with Senator Dole and seeing, seeing a man who was uh, getting along in age, who had a back brace that was bigger than he was, he got a little back issue going on, and, and people were trying to make it easy on him, he wouldn't hear it. He kept charging ahead. I mean, this reminds you of that World War II generation that, again, went off with great optimism, changed the course of history, and then came back to America and changed the course of American history. So, you know, I, I don't have much time for people to think we're in some kind of decline. I think we can do anything we want to do. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we've got a lot of challenges right now, and it'd be nice if we could work our way through those a little quicker than we seem to be able to do. Having said that, I have no doubt we're going to get to the other side and be stronger because of it. Okay, great. We'll do two more uh, questions, and I get to steal the last one. I'll, I'll use the uh, last one for my own benefit, which is a fun one. Uh, this one talks about your book and that you talk a lot about your Vietnam experiences and that, how that sort of shaped your philosophy on, on leadership and, and the need to have a clear strategy that will lead to... Uh, have a compelling action story associated with that strategy and that those were two elements lacking from, from that conflict. Um, were you able to take those lessons that you learned in Vietnam and apply them as you were in, uh, in office as the Joint Chiefs around 9-11? Uh, did it change your philosophy? I mean, where are you sort of from a leadership philosophy perspective from what you learned coming out of Vietnam and what you applied as you it's a great question. Time. I think we have some of the folks in the room here that are also <clears throat> Vietnam veterans. And uh, clearly that conflict had a profound effect on any of us that served in it. Um, lost over 58,000 great Americans. Um, and, it was, and it was a war that wasn't uh, prosecuted uh, very well in, in many respects. So as a young captain, you don't know all of that, but you get a sense of that. Of course, you're flying over there and you see that Gee, we want the, the, the Navy and the Air Force to, we don't want unified effort over in Norway. We want each of us have our own little geographic areas that we bomb. Um, I mean, so there's no unity of command. Um, we, sometimes we did a lot of things for the wrong reason. We tried to throttle um, our aggressiveness to bring, them, uh, bring the North Vietnamese to the, the negotiating table. And, but the people that paid the price, of course, were the, the, the folks that were prosecuting the war. So you, you, you bomb away for a month and then you stand down for a while hoping the North Vietnamese would take this as a sign they've got to come to the peace table. Meanwhile, they're reloading. They were almost out of missiles. They were almost out of all the things that shoot at aircraft. And then you start again in a couple of weeks and they've just reloaded, retrained, and they're, you're back at it. And that's kind of nonsense. So I think those lessons never go away. And those were, you know, as a captain in the Air Force, I didn't think I'd be hanging around for 40 years, but those lessons stick with you. And I think what you saw out of that and some of the work that Congress forced in the military through the Goldwater Nichols Act to, to make the various services work well together, that was all, I think, 
probably played out in the, in the 21st century in Afghanistan and Iraq in ways that even the, the folks that did the legislation probably didn't imagine. But it, it helped correct a lot of those problems that we saw in Vietnam. And it was just, it, I think any of us that were impacted by that weren't, weren't going to let that slide. That was, that was a very important message to us. Okay, great. Last question, what was it like to be on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> actually, here's what I remember. I remember going to the studio. This is what your publisher, when you write a book, this is what the publisher was doing, trying to sell books. I was semi-enthusiastic about this. And, uh, and of course, I had watched The Daily Show, and I was uh, very aware that a, a guest of about 10 days prior, Jim Cramer, had been skewered by, uh, by John Daly. And I said, what if he sees me as the second coming of Jim Cramer? <laughs> and I thought, this, 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 has only, this can only be a bad outcome. So I'm in the, uh, in the little green room, and he comes back, and, and very first of all, well, hi, uh, General Myers, and we, we talked for a while. And he says, where's, where's everybody that's with you? I said, just me, because I'm out of the service now. Says, and I think that impressed him, because apparently Kramer came, his uh, producer told me later, with a real entourage, you know, 10, 12 people. And I think he was impressed that I was there alone. So I think it started this whole idea of let's show a little mercy to him. <laughs> and, uh, and then we got going, and he's a funny guy. And um, I thought it was appropriate to try to weave in a little humor from time to time. So we wouldn't get to the real serious issues that we wanted to talk about, and it, it went by. It was a, it was actually one of the best experiences I've had on any uh, show. And uh, you know, even he's quite smart and be quite serious. His his respect for the military is profound. He does a lot of work with the USO and others uh, that he wants no credit for, and he does. He, he is he really connects with the troops, and he does it often. And he'll come down to Washington D.C. and do things that. At uh, formerly Walter Reed, now Walter Reed at Bethesda, uh, the flagship hospital where our most seriously wounded go. And he does it all under the radar. And, and so it was actually found to be a great experience, one that I was really, really worried about. <laughs> Unlike this one. Right? <laughs> I was quite worried about you, Michael. <laughs> actually, you've been very kind. Oh, good. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for the comments. Everybody, thank, thank you. you for the questions. Thank They're you. Great questions. Thank you.